going to be talking next about Ostia and Portus. And if you've been to Rome itself, how, how many of you have been to Rome? Quite a lot. How many of you have been to Ostia? Yeah, not so many. It's one, one of the tragedies of people. I mean, there's so much to see in Rome, of course, you know, that uh, you don't need to stray very far from the, the, the city itself. But if you're ever there again, it's well worth making the, the trip on the, the, the local train down to Ostia. Uh, well, it's the train that goes down to Ostia Lido uh, down on the coast, but it drops you off at Ostia Antica, the, the ancient uh, Roman site, which is several miles inland now. Uh, wonderful place to visit and um, add it to your itinerary, just as if you're heading for Vienna in the near future. Go and see Canuntum as well. Uh, Location of Rome, you need to begin with you know, why Rome is where it is and what it meant to have Rome in that particular location, what the consequences were as the city grew in size. Now, of course, Rome lies about halfway down the, the western side of the Italian peninsula. The peninsula itself, the whole spine of it, consists of the Apennine Mountains that go in a great curve from up here near Turin, right the way across, almost to the east coast of the peninsula, then heading back across towards the west coast, down into the, the Tour of Italy and across into Sicily. You know, so the, the whole of the peninsula is dominated by this uh, mountain spine. The result being that apart from the Po Valley up in the north here, there's the river Po coming from up north of Turin, eventually ending up in the Adriatic Sea over here, you've got a, a large area of fertile land there, but it was fairly malarial right through until the 3rd and 2nd centuries BC, so that although it was good agricultural land, it was a very unattractive place to settle, you know, literally a a killer of an area to live. Once you get away from the Po Valley, uh, the, the major areas of good farmland are small areas along the coast uh, where there's often volcanic soils. You get small plains, the soil's volcanic, it's very rich, uh, but the, the, the areas are fairly small. One of those areas is over here, it's the Latium Plain. A lot of volcanoes, that's what these uh, triangles, you can just make out in this rather poor map. Uh, the triangles are where there are volcanoes and the, the plain of Latium was a, a, one of these rich uh, agricultural areas, and this is where the, the city of Rome is to develop. It too is in a, a malarial area, uh, a, a serious hazard, of course, right the way through until modern times. I, mean, I think I'm right in saying that it was only in the 1950s that malaria was finally eradicated in modern Italy. Uh, prior to that, it was um, a, a tremendous scourge, particularly in the south of Italy, and debilitating, which wasn't necessarily that it killed you, but it left you debilitated for the, the rest of your life. Uh, the area is important, however, because, again, because of the mountains, the major routes in Italy are ones along the coast on either side, so that if you're moving along the, the west coast of Italy, you'll constantly come across rivers, not particularly large ones, you're nothing like the Rhine or the Danube, of course, and not even anything like the Po, but there are a number of rivers come down into the, uh, into the uh, Tyrrhenian Sea here, and you have to get across them. And when you arrive at these river mouths, you often find that you're in a malarial area. People at that point encountering the river in a malarial marshy area near the mouth of a river would turn inland, go upstream, looking for an appropriate place to cross, you know, to somewhere that was, uh, where the river was narrower and it was easier to get across rather than at the, the mouth. There's the river Tiber coming down into the... Uh, the Serenian Sea, and that's one of these larger rivers that comes out into the sea. So it was one of the rivers where people making their way up and down the coast would constantly encounter a river, would move inland looking for somewhere to get across, and it's where they found that was convenient to cross, not ideal, but convenient to cross, that the city of Rome was founded. Uh, then a little more detail is the, the, the wider area of the plain of uh, Latium with Rome there, there's the Tiber coming, winding its way down here, and although it's not a, a, a great river, uh, it was nevertheless navigable for relatively small boats, and we've got accounts from the Roman imperial period of boats coming, not just upriver that we'll look at in, in a moment, you know, from the sea, but even coming down from the interior, carrying brushwood you know, as fuel for, uh, for the, 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 the great city itself. But if you're making your way up the coast or down the coast, you arrive near the mouth of the river, you head up inland, and eventually you'll come to a place where there are a number of uh, quite high hills that come in close to the river, making the river narrower at that point, and where there's also an island in the middle of the river. And that was seen as a, 
a better place to cross. Still difficult, but better. And there it is, just in, in, in detail with Rome. So you can see that Rome itself is some distance from the sea, and it was getting further and further from the sea as the, the years passed, for the reasons I'll come to in a moment. But its port, uh, its equivalent of Fremantle, is Ostia, down here, at one of the mouths of the river. And the symbols imply that you're dealing with marshy land there. Uh, when this city was abandoned in the, the 5th and 6th centuries AD, all of this area reverted to marshland because of the, the canals that had been cut in Roman times ceased to function properly and the land sort of reverted to being marshy. So we're told that when the, the English king, um, Richard the II, Curd Leon, the one who went off to the pipe because he... Sorry? We, one of the Richards. He was an English king, not, not, not important. Uh, he, he paused in this area and went hunting boar in the, in the marshlands and forests at the, the mouth of the Tiber. Uh, the people who made their way upland, uh, upriver, uh, this is where they would have come to, where there was a series of hills, the famous seven hills of Rome. Uh, and as you can see, one of the highest is the one that uh, is the capital. You know, its name, of course, being transferred to modern Washington, and the island and the river there. So this was seen as an ideal place to cross over, where the river had narrowed and where there was a, uh, an island, so you could make your way across in two stages. Uh, it was to be some years before bridges were built. But the, the, the combination of the hills and the, the crossing point available there meant this was where the, the, the city of Rome was to be founded. And as you can see, that's 22 kilometers inland from the, the, the mouth of the Tiber. Uh, initially, uh, probably founded about 1000 BC, uh, the Romans themselves knew exactly when it was founded. It was the 21st of April, 753 BC, but they made that up you, you, centuries later. They didn't actually know when it was, but they were encountering all these smart Alec Greek cities in the south of uh, Italy, you know, places like Naples and uh, Metapontum and so on, and the Greeks knew exactly when their cities were founded. To the day, they knew the name of the person who'd founded them, so the Romans invented their legends as well, and they invented their foundation date. And after that, they celebrated that year. Uh, indeed, they celebrated the year by saying, dating in those terms, they would say that such and such had happened, ab urbe condida, from the foundation, the year of the city, uh, you know, so that the year in which Julius Caesar went to Britain for the first time that we call 55 BC, the Romans would have called that the year Abu Condita 690. You do the arithmetic. I can't, won't try and do it offhand, uh, but you see what I mean. Uh, initially, very modest place, uh, a lot of the activity involving salt extraction from the Tiber marshes, salt being a, an important commodity for you know, salting food to carry you through the winter. By about 500 BC, possibly a few thousand people there, uh, the estuary uh, had made them rather vulnerable to piracy along the coast of the, the, the west coast of the Italian peninsula. Uh, you, once you've got a few thousand people and something to lose. Uh, 338 BC is the year, probably accurate in this case, uh, of when the Romans, from the city of Rome itself, decided to found a military colony at the mouth of the river Tiber uh, to protect themselves against pirates. It was important to them to have you know, control over the Tiber estuary and the way to do that was to found a military colony there to stop pirates uh, coming into the estuary and indeed making their way upland to, to attack the city of Rome. By the first century BC, Ostia, this uh, military colony, uh, had become an important uh, town in its own right. So the, the first of the two port towns that we're going to look, look at is Ostia. Uh, the reason that it becomes important, of course, is not it was originally established as a military colony for a, a specific, very local purpose uh, to prevent uh, piracy there. Uh, but in, over the course of the, the, the subsequent centuries, as the city of Rome itself grew from a few thousand people to perhaps as many as a million people, Ostia took on a, uh, an importance in relation to the capital city. Uh, Rome had to be supplied with just about everything. Uh, Italy itself, the whole of Italy itself, did not produce enough surplus food to feed the one million people in the city of Rome who were not farmers. So food had to be brought in from all around the Mediterranean, preferably from places where it could be brought in by sea uh, and where there were large surpluses. You know, so Carthage in North Africa has the hinterland 
modern Tun Tunisia uh, that produced large grain surpluses. So Carthage was a, one of these ports from which grain fleets sailed to Rome every year. Uh, the other great uh, source of grain was Sicily, the island of Sicily, and then ultimately the really big one was Egypt because the Nile Valley produced huge surpluses of grain. It could be easily shipped down the, the Nile, easily put then onto ships and making use of trade winds, the, the, the ships could then make their way across the Mediterranean and unload their cargoes on the west coast of Italy uh, for the city of Rome. Now that, that's just grain, and I talked about a lot of this in a lecture on the hinterland of Rome, I think two or three years ago now, so some of you may have been here for that. Uh, because it's not just grain, everything else has to be brought in as well. Uh, the other major staples were uh, olive oil, and again, Italy didn't produce enough olive oil to, uh, to, to feed the one million people in the city of Rome, so it has to be brought in from where those surpluses. In this case, that's principally Spain, as it is today. You know, modern Spain is still one of the, the great producers of olive oil anywhere in the world. So oil, olive oil being brought in in these great clay jars, uh, amphorae being brought in from the west into, into Rome, wine being brought in from all around the Mediterranean, but in particular from uh, the south of France, and then there's all the other things that you can think of. I mean, you, you name it, it had to be imported into Rome. You know, material for clothing, uh, metals, timber, fuel. Uh, we're told even that there was a huge trade in flowers, uh, flowers being brought in from other parts of the empire, being brought in by ship uh, into, the, the, into the city of Rome. They all have to come in, or ideally they all have to come in through the city of Ostia uh, at the mouth of the Tiber. So Ostia develops because Rome has grown, Ostia then has to develop in a particular way. It began as a small military colony, but it has to become a great port with immense port facilities. And it's a rather unlikely place to have a, a port of any kind, much less a good port, because the coastline there is very um, changeable. Uh, the river Tiber brings down a lot of silt. It deposits that in the estuary area, gradually pushing, pushing the mouth of the river further and further out to sea, so that the Roman... Ostia, that was on the coast, is now several miles inland. You know, the coastline has been pushed out by the river, bringing down salt for, uh, silt for the last 2,000 years. There it is. Uh, as I said, it's about 22 kilometres in a straight line from Rome, but downstream about 30 kilometres. Uh, originally, this military colony, the so-called Castrum, it's quite small, it's about 2.5 hectares. That's the original settlement there of... You know, citizens who are there to act as soldiers and protect the estuary. Very limited space in the entrance to the river in its estuary for ships of any kind when it's originally founded. And ships cannot go upstream. The, the, the river is just not suitable for seagoing ships to make their way upstream, even the, the, the old uh, ships of the ancient world. So everything has to be taken off the ships at Austria, put onto barges, small barges, and then the barges are taken upstream, often being pulled by horses on towpaths. So Again, there's a tremendous uh, source of labour needed in the city of Ostia simply to take care of all these ships coming in and not just wave them as they make their way upstream to Rome, but actually to take all the cargoes off and then move it upstream to the city of Rome. So the, the town develops. A lot of the produce uh, can't be moved immediately. It's put into warehouses there. So you've got a port, you've got a military colony, you've got people who are employed in this whole activity, and then you have all these buildings that are... Uh, necessary for a great port city and as a place that will store produce for the city of Rome when it's needed. Uh, here's what it looks like today on a, a Google Earth image. Uh, here's the Tiber coming down there and making its way out to sea. Here's Roman Ostia there. In Roman times, the coast ran along about here. So you can see all of this area, all these fields, has been added since Roman times. And it was already starting to silt up. Well, it was already, it's been silting up for, for thousands of years. But even during the Roman imperial period, Ostia was gradually becoming a place that was further and further from the, the actual coast. And it was recognized that something had to be done, you know, that it simply wasn't suitable for uh, the, the whole city of Rome to be supplied through such a, a, a miserable little place at the estuary of a rather miserable river which itself was now pushing the coast miles away from it. So Roman Ostia is there. Uh, with the, the modern railway comes past down here, and you can simply walk across to the town. Uh, Portus, the town that replaces it, is up here. 
next to the great hexagonal harbour that we'll look at later. And if you've flown into Rome, you would have seen it out the window if you were on the right side of the airplane. It's right there beside the airport. Here's the airport there. Uh, it's still full of water. It's one of these great striking features that you see if you're, you're on the right side of the plane as you, as you leave or, or uh, arrive. Uh, however, going back for a moment to Ostia, just to you know, follow the story of that a little, here's the original Castrum, this military colony from 338 BC. You're very regular, uh, a gate in the middle of each side, but then gradually the town develops all round about it. It ceases to be necessary as a military site and simply becomes this important town with streets, houses, warehouses, all the paraphernalia of a port city and the, the Tiber coming down there nearby. That's fine as long as the Tiber goes out into the sea here. Once it starts to go out into the sea over here, uh, that's rather less convenient. Uh, in the first century AD, the two and a half hectares of the original Castrum has become a town of 69 hectares. Uh, if you've been to Pompeii, then Pompeii covers about 65 hectares. So it's about the same size as Pompeii, uh, but it's much more convenient to get to uh, than Pompeii. Uh, imports, well, foodstuffs that I mentioned already, the, the, the grain in particular, but wine and olive oil. Um, and when I talked about the, the hinterland of Rome and feeding the city of Rome in that lecture two or three years ago, I mentioned that one of the, the features that you should try and look at if you're in Rome again is uh, Monte Testacio. It's an artificial hill on the banks of the Tiber. Uh, if I remember right, it's about 50 meters high and it's entirely composed of broken oil jars. Uh, these amphorae that the oil was brought in on, they emptied the oil out, they decanted it, and then they smashed them to, you know, so they took up less space and they just they dumped them and dumped them until you've now got this artificial hill. I forget the number, I think it's something like, I believe from the, the excavations that the Spanish team has done, there, there's something like 56 million amphorae smashed on this, this site. So just the oil alone represented a huge undertaking bringing so much into the city. Then there's wine and then the grain and everything else. Uh, the other things being you know, metals, textiles, timber, and so on, uh, to supply the, the, this great city. Uh, the grain fleet itself, although even in the imperial period when they'd improved the harbours, uh, the grain fleets that brought all the foodstuffs from Egypt and from Carthage and Sicily could not all come into Ostia. It simply couldn't manage them. So half of the fleet went to Putioli, further south on the, the top of the Bay of Naples, and then would be shipped from there coastally up and then into the Tiber. Uh, Ostia simply couldn't cope with all of the grain fleets alone, so they, they had to you know, split it to a, a port well down the coast. But it was essential that the food supply was guaranteed. The emperors reside in Rome. One of the, the, the greatest dangers facing Roman emperors was not the members of the Senate who might stab them in the back, uh, but riots in the city uh, by if there was a food shortage, if there was a famine of any kind. And, we know of at least one instance when a would-be emperor engineered a food, a food shortage in order to cause uh, upheaval in the city. So the emperors took keen care to see that the food supply was constant, reliable. There's no good having an average that was good. It, there had to be adequate food there 365 days of the year. So they appointed very senior officials to overlook the grain supply, the wine supply, and so on. There were all these people there to look after this and then all the necessary buildings on the banks of the Tiber, and all the engineering works that were necessary to keep the Tiber open you know, for barges to move up and down. But in, in particular, they had to make sure that the arrival point, the port itself, was adequate for the ships to come into. Now, that's what it looks like today. This is Ostia. There's the, you know, the Tiber coming down there, heading down towards the sea, and you can see the sea is a long way off now. Here's the ruins, very considerable, because the, the place was abandoned, largely abandoned in Roman, late Roman times, but certainly abandoned in the, by the beginning of the Middle Ages. And what you see as you go around there, some of the most striking buildings are the granaries, uh, because they were unloading lots of the food there from the ships into granaries, they store it there, and then they move it upstream. Granaries had to be places that, had, that were dry and uh, largely impervious to uh, rodents. You know, so they very often have raised floors for air to circulate underneath, and they're compartmentalized inside you to make sure that if the grain was uh, got weevils in one bin that it was not contaminating the one next to it. So these granaries are often some of the most striking buildings that you see there. They're well built, they're really solid structures, well engineered, and they've had an influence on 
uh, architecture in more recent times, uh, namely the Boston Public Library, was inspired by one of the granaries that uh, the, the design of the Boston Public Library was inspired by one of these granaries at Ostia. There it is there, Boston Public Library. Uh, the harbour mouth and the port problems, uh, it's too small. Uh, there's Ostia there. There's the river as it was in Roman times, when the city was at its peak, coming around like that. And there's the channel as it is today. But you can see that the coast has moved a long way out. Now, you, can, you may be able to read it better than I can. I think that's saying there that this is the early Roman imperial coastline here. Is that, am I reading it correctly? These sand dunes are post-Roman but these are the dates at which they think the coastline was moving out, you know, so that's 1876, 1770, I think it is, uh, and so on all the way back. But you can see that as the coastline moved out and the river channel itself moved, uh, Ostia uh, lost its primary purpose, and they had to find some way around that. So the Emperor Claudius built a great new artificial harbour up here on the coast with immense moles going out into the sea to provide shelter for ships to come into. Uh, a tremendous undertaking. He was hugely proud of it. You were told that he was actually down there inspecting it when messages came saying that his Empress Messalina was carrying on back in Rome, going through a mock crowning of her uh, latest boyfriend. And he had sort of hurriedly rushed back to Rome and had them all put to death. As one does. But Claudius' harbour there proved not to be uh, suitable, you know, despite the, the Roman reputation for skill and engineering. Uh, not too long afterwards, an entire grain fleet in the harbour was largely destroyed during, uh, during storms. So they hadn't cracked the problem yet. They, they'd started working on it. They were going to have an artificial harbour. It was going to be some distance from uh, Old Austria, indeed some distance from the Tiber, uh, so that it wasn't going to be at the mercy of the, uh, the changes in the Tiber, and it was going to be up there. But it was left to the Emperor Trajan to preside over the actual solution. So they created this great new hexagonal harbour there, and they put in canals from the Tiber that passed through it. So it became a combination of Claudius's harbour and Trajan's inner harbour, uh, where you could actually shelter ships. You know, so you've got a semi-shelter in Claudius's one, and then you've got the actual shelter through in the great Trajanic harbour there. Once they had done that, and this proved to be the solution to you know, the, the port of Rome, you know, to have this artificial harbour, old Austria gradually declines. People who made the living there from the port move so that the place that was originally simply called the port came to be a town in its own right called Portus. And there, another one of these interpretations of what the coastline was like as the Roman first century AD coastline there. And you can see this is how it's changed today. But there's Claudius's harbour there with the moles going out into the sea. But then Trajan's harbour there. And uh, the this is a canal that... Uh, came in past the harbour there. <coughs> uh, Claudius was tremendously proud of what he'd done. Uh, a, coin, a coin was struck commemorating his new harbour. Uh, there it is, shown with the quayside. So this will be the quayside buildings shown as if, you know, this is on a coin, shown as if the line flat. You know, there's a sort of traditional representation of buildings where you know, there's no point in showing the bird's eye view of a roof. You, know, you wanted to show what it looked like that people would actually see if they were looking at it at ground level. So they lay these things out flat to represent probably the warehouses. On this side, these are probably the, uh, the slips for ships to be drawn up. They look rather like the ones that you get at the, the harbour of Athens and the harbour of Carthage. So this is probably... Uh, where ships could be drawn up for drying. A few token ships in the harbour, a lighthouse there. Uh, here's a ship with oars, the others are all sailing ships, and a deity with a dolphin in his left hand. Uh, I'm not quite sure what he got in his right hand. It looks like a musical instrument of some kind. So that was Claudius's uh, depiction of his harbour, you know, the special commemorative coin that was struck for it. 
excavations back in the uh, earlier part of the 20th century revealed some of the substructure of the mole of Claudius's Harbour, these great stone structures were built and then the, the mole built on top of that and then you know, <coughs> stone structures on top of that uh, all of this is high and dry now, it's, it's inland, you know, the, the coast has moved on, Claudius's Harbour is entirely silted up and there's the, uh, the actual coin um, struck by the Emperor Nero uh, but commemorating his father Claudius's achievement and as you can see, it was during the time of Nero in AD 62. Lots of disasters happened around Rome and Nero's reign, apart from Nero himself. Uh, in AD 62, we're told that 200 ships were destroyed in Claudius's harbour. Uh, the new harbour of Trajan. Here's the old Ostia there. Here's the new hexagonal harbour. And here's Claudius's harbour up there. I've turned it round because I think the next slide is not quite what I intended. But uh, The hexagonal basin, you can see it's large. Uh, there's, there's the airport over here. Uh, the sides of the basin are 357 metres long. So it's, it's a big basin and all the warehouses round about it and then a whole town developed around that and then the road linking it back to Ostia became a, um, a sort of sacred way with uh, cemeteries along it and temples. Uh, there's been a major excavation going on there run by the British School of Archaeology in Rome uh, for some years now on Portus and the Via Sacra. Um, probably the measurements were intended to be 1,200 Roman feet for each side. That's what 357.77 metres uh, comes out at. Uh, maximum diameter is 715 metres, so it's a, it's a big basin, and it's about 5 metres deep. Quite a striking thing, not easy to get to. I've, I've tried two or three times, I've never actually been able to get there yet. <laughs> Even a lot going early a few years ago back to Rome Airport in order, I thought I'll just deposit my luggage and I'll walk across and have a look at it. Ha! <laughs> There's a, a rather busy highway in between and all sorts of fences and things and uh, it's just there but you can't reach it. Uh, last year's attempt was even more unsuccessful. That was when I arranged a taxi to take me and drop me at the front door. Uh, that's what it looks like at ground level. Yeah. It's quite spectacular still. And in the plan of what they've been excavating round about it, you know, the traces of some of the warehouses that we would have expected around all the sides of it. Uh, the, the channel coming down here past it. And an artist's impression of a model of what it may have looked like, you know, largely given over to the, the inevitable warehouses. So the new harbour that uh, first Claudius and then Trajan develop, and this is over a long period of time because Claudius is emperor in the, the, the 40s and 50s AD, Trajan becomes emperor in 96 uh, AD, so it's half a century later before Claudius's harbour is finally developed into the new combination of his harbour and Trajan's new one. Uh, but the fact that they've started making this new artificial harbour for the north draws people away, draws away the trade from ancient Austria, uh, so that you end up with a, a largely abandoned site. Uh, what's been uncovered in the excavations there? Uh, a church, bath buildings, temples, and of course uh, warehouses. And then, as I mentioned, there's the Isola Sacra, the, the cemeteries along the, the highway connecting back, I think this is it here, or maybe that, no, it's that one there, I think, is the Isola Sacra. Uh, again, it's not something you can get into, it's, uh, it's largely fenced off because it's uh, an important archaeological site. Uh, the church of Hippolytus uh, that's been excavated is there, you can see the characteristic apse at the top there. Uh, the Baths of Matidia, quite a, an extensive bath building. You know, not comparable, of course, to the great imperial baths in the city of Rome itself, but nevertheless, as you would expect in any self-respecting Roman town, there are going to be two, three, four bath buildings there. With all that that implied in terms of not just the amenities they're providing, uh, but the fuel that was needed simply to you know, provide for the, you're keeping the water hot and the rooms hot inside. You know, the, 
it, it was often wealthy individuals who would donate uh, the fuel for a year or five years or whatever, uh, or, or the oil that people needed in the baths. You had to provide oil for the oil lamps and the oil that people rubbed on and then scraped off you know, as part of the sort of uh, cleaning process in the, in the bath building. And of course, there's got to be a, a water source to bring water in and carry wastewater off. There's the location of these principal buildings around about it. There's the Christian Basilica there. That one I showed you a moment ago is just there on the, the banks. There's a round temple up here. Um, a dam over here. No, sorry, it's not a dam. Can't, can't read it properly. There's, there's a, another channel came through here that's long since been filled in. And there's the bath building down there. Uh, the great bath building, back to Timaeus Severus again. He's one of these people who you, you, you find him everywhere. Uh, he's at Canuntum, raising the standard of rebellion. There he is with his family on that nice painted tondo. Uh, and here he is again as the, the man who's responsible for, or during whose reign, this immense granary was built. That's where the horia is. With all the, the individual rooms, you couldn't simply stack grain up in sort of great uh, warehouses. It all tended to be put in rooms that have strong walls and buttresses because of the, the thrust from the grain inside. And there has to be plenty of air circulating as well to, to keep things dry. And there's what uh, the remains of it look like. You can see that even today, quite substantial remains there. Brick-faced concrete, you know, so there's a concrete core but with a brick facing on it. And there may well have been some sort of cladding on the outside of part of that. But there's the, uh, the arcades of the, this granary of Septimius Severus. And the artist's impression of what it may have looked like, a two-story high building, they think, from the, uh, the foundations. So tremendous architectural achievement. You're just actually visiting somewhere like this. It would have been quite striking. You didn't need to think in terms of the great public buildings. You know, just the, the functional ones, like a granary like this, you know, would have been a, a, a marvel. And uh, the activities of the port appear in a great deal of Roman art. You're depicting ships. In this case, uh, we've got... We're told the name of the ship. It's the Isis Gaminia. There's its name there. So the ship's called the Isis Gaminia. Here's its master, Magister. He's got the name Phanases, which is not a Roman name. It's actually a Parthian name. So he's probably originally from uh, beyond the Roman frontier, modern uh, uh, Iran or Iraq. There's somebody called Ariscansus there. And you can see that the sacks have actually got the word telling you what's inside them. Rays, corn. Here's somebody walking up the gangplank here with a, a sack of more grain on his, his back. So this one's being loaded with grain. So presumably it is really just a, a, a barge for going up the river. It's not a, a great sea growing ship. And uh, an amphora being car carried on a shoulder. Uh, it's thought that this is why you're the, the, they're that particular design, that they're relatively easy to get on your shoulder and hold you know, with one of the, the rings, at the, oops, rings at the neck up here. Uh, there's a marble yard at Portus as well with uh, the mason's marks on it. All of this, of course, just abandoned you as the, the place went into decline in the Roman period, the early medieval period, so uncovered by the archaeologists. The stone that had been brought there was a marble for sale but was never sold and eventually is abandoned, covered over and excavated in modern times. Uh, Claudius's harbour on Nero's coin I've shown you already. I'm not sure why I put it in again, other than it's a beautiful coin. Yes, it is the same one, isn't it? I thought just for a moment it was different ships in it, but it's not. Uh, but look at the marvellous detail in it. It's, it's not just a, a crude representation of a ship. I mean, they've actually shown a furled sail there, the oars on this rowing ship there, some of the ropes on the sails of this one. Oh, that's what I meant to show you next, was the, the harbour of Trajan. He was equally proud of his harbour. There's Trajan on the left. Uh, Trajan born in, in Spain, but to the descendants of uh, Italian immigrants to Spain. And there's his hexagonal harbour there, again with the warehouses shown looking like almost like a sort of filleted fish, you know, with the, the, shown on, flat on, the, on their backs, uh, and claiming that, the, well, the, the coin was struck by Senatus Consultum, by the authority of the Senate. And in this case, just one ship, or just one that's uh, 
easily discernible up there. Uh, another piece of sculpture that shows us, you know, the sort of bustling, busy harbour. This is the, the famous Tolonia relief. Uh, you're showing a sailing ship. Uh, even the decoration on the sail is visible, all these people on deck. Here's the uh, statue at the entrance, uh, the um, lighthouse, there's the, the flame there. Another ship over here. I'm not quite sure what this is. Oh, yes, it is. It's a, it's a chariot, isn't it? Being drawn by elephants. Yeah, so it's a, um, it's a, it's a piece of statuary. Uh, various deities shown standing around the, uh, the sides of it. But it's, it's the sort of so much going on. It's a, it's a bustling place, as a, as a port city inevitably is. And the detail of the ship with the, the decorations on the sail itself. It's the, the she wolf, isn't it? The, the, the Roman, yes, there's Romulus and Remus under the wolf, and the same over there, just so it's you know, shown twice, and all these people on deck, all the ropes being shown, and the various bits of the uh, the, the tackle for the ship, uh, rudder down here, not sure what this chap is doing, but it's a rather dangerous place to be. But even the, the detail of the ship here, with the, the large, uh, of the rope rather, there. And the, again, with another one of these artist's impressions, just to give you some idea, since the, the harbour itself is very striking, but when you, you get there, I believe, since I've never actually managed to get there, uh, not much of what was once uh, on the site uh, actually survives as a, a major upstanding ruin. This is as far as I got last year. <laughs> yeah, we're, we'd arranged to go back to Rome a day early so that we could actually get the taxi driver to take us to precisely how we could get to the entrance. And of course we got there and there's a splendid sign saying you know, the archaeological park is 200 metres that way and a, a nice friendly little ancient Roman figure there to uh, welcome us. Oops, sorry. It's only open Thursdays, Saturdays and Sundays from the 27th of August to the 30th of October. So when we got there, Chiuso, <laughs> closed. That seems to be the, the story of so many monuments in Italy I've tried to go to. You arrive and you, you come the one day of the week, it seems, that's closed. I'm sure that they anticipate your arrival and close it that day. Anyway, uh, thank you very much. It's uh, getting very warm in here, so it's probably time to offer you the opportunity to ask any questions you might have for a few minutes, and then uh, we can set off to somewhere cooler, prefer probably our homes. Does anyone have any questions I can try and answer? Yes. That sounds ominous. Firstly, do we have a duty to contemplate destroying our own supply ships? And secondly, why do the Romans not grow food in these sacred areas? Not grow food, sorry? Why do the Romans not grow food in these sacred areas which should be rich? Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, the, the first of these, the, the, it's only after Rome has conquered the Carthaginian state in Tunisia and they've turned Carthaginian Carthage into the new Roman city of Carthago uh, that uh, they exploit the hinterland of Carthage and start bringing the food from there. Prior to that, their major food supply was the island of Sicily, which they'd taken from the Carthaginians as well. So that uh, at the time that Carthage was a rival to Rome, they were not importing food from North Africa, uh, only from Sicily and only the city of Rome was much smaller uh, at that time as well, so they were not as dependent on bringing food from overseas. Uh, as for uh, their exploitation of the silty lands around the mouth of Tiber, they, they did, but it, the ancient surpluses were much smaller than today. I mean, we take it for granted that a farmer and his dog and a tractor can produce enough food for the, lo the local town. Uh, in antiquity, surpluses were very small, so that most farmers needed almost everything they grew themselves. So that once the city of Rome reached a million people, its hinterland, indeed all of these fertile plains around the coast of Italy, including the Po Valley, uh, were simply inadequate to you know, provide the grain supply. Plus it was difficult to get food from some of these. You know, you know, transporting food in land in the ancient world was ex enormously expensive. You know, it was, if you could get it to the, the water and transport it by water, fine. Uh, but if you had to carry it on mules or in carts being drawn by oxen, you've got to feed the mules and the oxen as well. So after a time, 
the mules and the oxen are eating what they're carrying in order to keep going. You, know, you sort of you get beyond the point at which you can move things. So uh, they had to rely on importing food by sea uh, from wherever they could get it. And that initially Sicily, subsequently Tun Tunisia as well, and then ultimately in, on a, a big scale, Egypt. Uh, any other questions? Okay, in that case, I'll, I'll thank you all for coming. And uh, you've got Guy de la Bedo, yeah, who's going to be here in two weeks' time. Just remind you, it's on Sunday, not Saturday, and it's at 10.30 in the morning, not 1.30 in the afternoon. Otherwise, thank you very much. <laughs>